Hello everyone, I'm Hartford HealthCare's Tina Verona. Thank you so much for joining us for this live Facebook discussion. Well, September is AFib or Atrial Fibrillation Awareness Month, and it is one of the most common heart rhythm abnormalities that affects nearly three million people. I am so happy to be joined by Dr. Steven Zweibel. He's the Director of Electrophysiology for Hartford HealthCare's Heart and Vascular Institute. Always a pleasure to have you here. Thank sure. you. Thank you for having me. Well, real simple, let's start out by talking, you hear ads all the time for AFib. AFib on, on the TV, but what is AFib? So AFib, as you said, is one of the most common heart rhythm abnormalities, mm -hmm. and it's a regular beating in the upper chambers of the heart all, or the atrium, and so mm -hmm. it causes the lower chambers of the heart to go rapid and irregular, and it can cause symptoms such as palpitations, lightheadedness, dizziness, shortness of breath when people exert themselves. What actually causes atrial fibrillation or somebody to go into this condition? Yep, so there are many causes. Probably the most common cause is hypertension or high blood pressure, which has been undertreated or untreated for many years. Mm -hmm. This leads to buildup of pressure in the heart and atrial fibrillation. Uh, we sometimes see patients who have sleep apnea that has not been treated mm -hmm. that also can lead to atrial fibrillation. People who may be drinking a lot of alcohol can lead to atrial fibrillation. And on occasion, we do see people who have reversible problems like an overactive thyroid that could lead to atrial fibrillation as well. And people should never underestimate this condition. This mm. is a, literally a life-threatening condition um, that is five-fold times uh, to lead to stroke if yep. left untreated. Yep. So there, again, different patients have different risks of having a stroke. And mm -hmm. so if patients do have risk factors for having a stroke, which may be things like high blood pressure or known coronary disease or an age over 65, those patients may require blood thinner to prevent them from having a stroke. So mm -hmm. it can be very serious and certainly is not an arrhythmia that should be ignored or left alone. This needs to be uh, treated immediately. Let's talk about the a AFib Center here at Hartford Hospital. I think what's unique about this center is that there's a lot of you under one roof, but so much more. There's a, it's a multidisciplinary team that really comes together um, with one thing in mind to treat the patient and really all facets of the patient. Talk to us a little bit about um, the process at the, at the center. Sure, so initially patients usually are picked up by either their internist or their PCP here at Hartford HealthCare or their cardiologist. Uh, they eventually then get will get referred in to us as an electrophysiologist to help treat them with medications uh, initially. If medications fail, then they may go for an invasive procedure here at uh, Hartford Hospital where we'll put catheters in through veins in the leg inside the heart and either burn or freeze heart tissue. It's called an ablation to try and treat atrial fibrillation. Uh, sometimes these patients are found to have heart valve problems and they are referred to our cardiac surgeons. Uh, those surgeons will obviously go in and fix, or replace, or repair the heart valve, but at the same time are skilled at doing an ablation procedure in the heart called a maze procedure mm -hmm. to try and prevent the atrial fibrillation from coming back. And when patients have that, this is truly a multidisciplinary team with the surgeons and the electrophysiologists working together to personalize care and coordinate care mm -hmm. for our patients to make sure they all have the best possible outcome. Absolutely, and if you're watching us and maybe live too far from Hartford Hospital, we do have expanded services across the state of Connecticut. Yep. So talk to us a little bit about where those services for the Heart and Vascular Institute lie around the state. Sure, uh, so obviously Hartford Hospital mm -hmm. is our, our main hub, but mm -hmm. we do have uh, an electrophysiologist down in uh, Bacchus Hospital in Norwich, Dr. Bott, who we recently hired about a year ago, who's becoming very busy down there. Mm -hmm. We have Dr. Marib, who uh, is a prominent electrophysiologist in the area down at Mid-State Medical Center. And then we have cardiologists all over our Hartford Healthcare uh, system mm -hmm. who are skilled at treating atrial fibrillation as well, and then know to refer their patients into us. Uh, for the more complex issues. I know we've been talking about AFib, but you do so much more uh, yep. than treat atrial fibrillation. There um, are heart rhythms as well, um, uh, uh, fast heart rhythms as well as slow heart rhythms. And we, we have a pacemaker here and a defibrillator here. Sure. Let's talk about the pacemaker here. These just keep getting smaller and smaller. Yeah, they do. <laughs> It's amazing. These used to be the size of the defibrillator yeah. that I'll show you in a minute. Mm -hmm. uh, so these devices are used for patients who have slow heart rhythm problems mm -hmm. and are symptomatic from them. They may have lightheadedness, dizziness, or passing out. Mm -hmm. uh, these are placed with a small incision in the left upper chest with wires or leads that mm -hmm. go through a vein into the heart. Uh, that hook to the device and then this is put under the skin. Uh, the device is monitored actually through a remote monitor. Uh, mm -hmm. We can use a phone 
-hmm. So an iPhone with Bluetooth can connect to the pacemaker and we use that to remotely monitor the device to make sure it's functioning well and to also notify us if the patient has any arrhythmias like atrial fibrillation. Um, and the battery in the device now lasts about 12 to 14 years. So we've right. come a long way. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and on a recent show, <laughs> we talked a little bit about that micro right. device, which is mm -hmm. a very small leadless pacemaker that gets placed into the heart. And there are no leads for that. It's actually the entire device is a tiny little capsule about that big that actually locks into the lower chamber of the heart, the right ventricle, using tines and can stay there. And again, that battery lasts for 12 to 14 years Yeah, as well. it's incredible, because yeah. initially they were, what, was it five to seven years? Yeah, or maybe even less than that yeah. when they originally came out. Yeah. And so as technology has improved, the devices have gotten smaller, gotten smaller. and the batteries yeah. have, have been more advanced, so they're lasting longer. Yeah, it's yeah. really incredible. Sure. Um, and then you have the defibrillator here for somebody who might be um, suspect to sudden cardiac arrest. Yep, and so this is a, an ICD, or an implantable cardioverted defibrillator. All ICDs actually have a pacemaker built into them, uh, so they can treat slow heart rhythm problems, but its primary role is to treat life-threatening, dangerous heart rhythm problems should they occur in patients. It can do that by pacing the heart rapidly to stop the rhythm or giving the heart a shock. Mm -hmm. uh, interestingly, these devices, as well as the pacemakers, can have either one wire or lead, two mm -hmm. leads, or three leads. And mm -hmm. the devices that now have three leads are used to help treat patients who have congestive heart failure. Right. Yep, and so the congestive heart failure treatment is treated by coordination of the pumping of the two lower chambers of the heart, and that therapy actually can improve patients' quality of life, reduce their chances of coming into the hospital with congestive heart failure. Yeah, absolutely. And mm -hmm. also, um, after I think, and, and we'll talk more a little uh, about telehealth, sure. um, because to actually when you pace these devices after, I think the experience, and, and you're extremely experienced in this mm -hmm. area, and I think is so critical in terms of being able to pace that rhythm to get it succinct um, so that people can go back to living their normal, full, and active lifestyles if they happen to choose so, if mm -hmm. they happen to have an active lifestyle. So talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, sure. I, you know, these devices have been become very, very complex. So they mm -hmm. have different algorithms in them and almost an infinite number of ways that the devices can be set. And so many patients, the basic kind of out-of-the-box setting works, but in many patients who have very specific needs, uh, having a thorough understanding and knowledge of how the device mm -hmm. is programmed and being able to program them appropriately uh, is incredibly important for patients. So we've had a patient that we've uh, talked to mm -hmm. who uh, had a pacemaker implanted elsewhere in New York was not feeling well, nobody mm -hmm. could figure it out. They came up here eventually, Dr. Thompson and I saw the patient and I was able to figure out what the issue was with mm -hmm. their pacemaker, reprogrammed it, and he went back to his running, normal running yeah. and marathon yeah. routine. Yeah. And so Pretty it, incredible yeah, um, to so, be able to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the telehealth too, so you yep. can do the at-home monitoring, which is important, sure. but now you've taken it one step further and after one of these devices is implanted, three weeks that follow-up visit, patients don't have to come back. Yeah, so we, we thought this was a great opportunity to perform telehealth. And so, as you said, patients who get the device put in have a small incision that is made. And so they would typically come to our office three weeks later. They'd have to take the day off of work. They'd have to have their son or daughter drive them in, et cetera. Now they use their phone. Mm -hmm. They have an app on their phone, uh, MyChart Plus, that links in with our medical record system. And one of my nurses is there on the other end in the appropriate time when we schedule the appointment, and they can see each other. So mm -hmm. my nurse can see the patient, the patient can see my nurse, they ask them how they're doing, they can use the camera on their phone to show them the incision to see that it's healing properly, and then using remote monitoring technology, which we've used for years, either through their phone or through a remote monitor, we can actually get information about the device to know that it's functioning normally. And so this has been a huge patient satisfier because mm -hmm. they can do this from the comfort of their own home. Yeah, and it's great for patients who perhaps maybe live out of state. They don't have to come back for that three-week yeah. follow-up visit. Absolutely. And we're the only hospital in Connecticut doing this, this yes. sort of telehealth, mm -hmm. and one of a very few in the country. So yep. that is impressive in and of itself. So thank you, as always, for being sure. on the leading edge of uh, and pioneering this new great technology. We appreciate it. Sure. And, of course, thank you so much at home for joining us. For more information, you can always call 833-444-0014. Thanks for watching. I'm Hartford HealthCare's Tina Verona. We'll see you next time.